So we continue with the polymer fibers and perhaps the most well-known uh, polymer fiber is uh, the Kevlar fiber. So that's a brand name for a commercial fiber from DuPont in the US. Um, well, maybe it's most well known for its use in uh, bulletproof vests. vests. Um, so let's start with the preparation. So this is a polymer fiber. We know that if we're going to make textile fibers, polyamide fibers or polyester fibers, we simply take um, polyethylene terephthalate, for instance, we do melt spinning. So we very fast can produce uh, thermoplastic fibers and we can weave them into textiles for clothes. Here it is a little bit more difficult because the polymer itself is not really thermoplastic in the sense that it um, can melt and, and be melt spun. So we need to do something else. It's based on an aramide polymer and this uh, is uh, synthesized. Arom aromatic polymers need to be synthesized um, inorganic solvent, so that by itself is a difficulty. But basically, once we have the polymer, um, we still keep it in an organic solvent. We have a bath, um, which is perhaps from minus 50 to minus 80 degrees centigrade. Um, then this, um, so this is, uh, polymer plus solvent then we bring this into a cylinder and this cylinder uh, holds a temperature of 200 degrees C so this will uh, result in solvent evaporation so that we can uh, create the fiber and uh, I think I will show you an uh, image what this looks like so um, so this is a highly schematic image from the literature um, you have the bath with the organic solvent and the polymer it goes through this cylinder and out comes, um, um, out comes the fiber. So we call this an as-spun fiber. So it's um, put up on a cylinder like this. So this as-spun fiber is actually not the final um, fiber product. So this uh, as-spun fiber um, typically The properties of this as spun fiber it typically has a strength tensile strength of maybe 800 megapascal and the modulus is actually quite low it's something like um, 4 gigapascal um, and the reason of course is that the orientation of the polymer molecules is incomplete. So then we need to do uh, another stage. So we do heating plus stretching because we need to align the molecules. You remember the carbon fibers, we also do heating and stretching, but the temperature range of course is completely different. Um, here we're not carbonizing, we're simply stretching the molecules to, to improve the orientation of the molecules. So then we end up with a modulus of uh, 125 gigapascal. That's pretty good. Uh, we have a strength of 2.8 to 3.6 gigapascal so um, and this is achieved 
So to, it's a polymer, so the density is 1.45 gram per cubic centimeter. So that's pretty impressive. That's um, um, yeah, more than half the value of steel modulus, and the density is 1.45. For steel, we have 7.8 gram per cubic centimeter. So this is actually um, very good. I'm trying to think of other applications for Kevlar fibers. They're also used in um, um, in sails as a stiffening uh, um, member of, of uh, advanced sails for sailboats. Um, it is used in composites where a larger extent of, of ductility is uh, expected from the material. Uh, but it's actually fairly expensive, so it's not um, um, used uh, as widely as one would expect from, based on these properties. And the reason, of course, is that this process is quite elaborate, and the polymer itself from the beginning is, is, um, is not cheap. So let's see if we can understand a little bit better why we can achieve this uh, fairly impressive properties. I mean, the, a regular polymer is nowhere near this modulus, 125 gigapascal, whereas the glassy polymer is around 4 gigapascal in modulus. So let's start with the structure, the chemical structure of the polymer. It's, um, it's not that complicated. It's basically two aromatic rings, two benzene rings, um, then we have uh, carbonyls around one of them, and we have amides on the other one. And the advantage of this structure is, well, first of all, it's aromatic, so it's rigid and has a high glass transition temperature. But the other thing is that it's um, suitable for hydrogen bonding interaction. So if we can stretch this molecule, you also have these flat rings. So then we can create a very interesting structure. So basically we have, let's see if I can do this so that it looks reasonably okay. So this symbolizes the benzene ring. Then we have, um, uh, the, yeah, let's say that's the carbonyl, and then we have the amide and then we have uh, the next aromatic ring and then we just continue the polymer like this well um, this molecule has a neighbor and this neighbor is also oriented if we did our uh, stretching properly so um, we just assume that the carbonyl goes there the amide goes there, and then uh, here is the next aromatic ring. So basically what we do then is that, so let's say this is the carbonyl, and this is the amide. Then we form hydrogen bonding here in between. And that's really the I can be a little bit I can make an attempt to be pedagogical and just map out the hydrogen bonding. It's a secondary interaction, but still it's very important. So we have um, uh, secondary intramolecular hydrogen bonds between the the aromatic molecules in aramid fibers and that, this is really helpful. So basically what we have is that we have uh, aligned and these are extended chains so the molecules are um, well stretched um, and then we have this uh, intermolecular 
hydrogen bonding between. And of course there is a strong packing, so we have high density of the polymer. I think I mentioned before already, it's uh, 1.45, so for a polymer that, that means that we have managed to pack the molecules uh, well. Yeah, so this is the principle for polymer fibers, and in, we can have many other uh, polymers forming interesting strong fibers based on this idea, and, and there are other alternatives as well. But let, let's look at the comparison between the different uh, types of fibers that we have now discussed. So how do you compare fibers? Well, one very popular way of doing it is um, that you compare in terms of uh, what is termed spe specific properties. So if I do this for the different fibers, and then I provide modulus over density, tensile strength over density, and then I give the units, it's uh, gigapascal, and then it's uh, 10 to the power of 3 times uh, kilogram per uh, cubic meter. So if I have those units and I take um, carbon fibers and I take the um, standard basic carbon fibers used in the aircraft industry for um, large-scale production, this number becomes 143 and the strength number with these units is 1.5. Actually, I think this is a little bit low. The real strength is probably higher. But it's fine for the purpose here. For glass fibers, as we may expect, this value is much lower. But in terms of strength, um, glass fibers are actually not doing so poorly, considering the low cost of these fibers. Kevlar, then, is not at all as uh, stiff per density, per unit density, as uh, carbon fibers. Uh, at the time when these data were generated, uh, Kevlar did better in terms of specific strength. I don't think that's true any longer because there are now uh, very sophisticated grades of carbon fibers that uh, will have a much higher number for this. But this is enough for, for a comparison, and, and uh, I think it's actually quite interesting. So glass fibers are often used because they provide quite good strength per, per um, uh, unit density. So let's try to uh, finish off here with uh, a little bit of a comparison in, in some critical aspects, and I will try to do this very quickly. Um, and basically, I, I think perhaps the main objective here is to identify some aspect which is important. So this is for, for different, obviously for different fibers. So one very important aspect is um, thermal stability. And um, actually, since we're talking about polymer composites, then um, usually the polymer is the weak link, so we don't really need to worry so much about um, the thermal stability of glass or the thermal stability of um, carbon fibers because the polymer is always the, the weak link. So, and the reason is that um, is that they have fairly low um, 
degradation temperature, so very few polymers can handle 200 degrees. So that's, of course, a problem, um, which means that um, a consequence of this is that only the polymer fibers have problems here with thermal degradation, which should be fairly obvious. Um, I would like to say something also about compressive properties. Um, glass fibers and carbon fibers have good properties in compression as well. That's related to the structure, which um, uh, should be clear by now what, what that structure is. But for Kevlar, there is an interesting observation. So the compressive strength is roughly 20% of the tensile strength. So, and the reason of course is uh, related to the structure. You have these aligned molecules. If you put force on the ends of the fiber, even if you stabilize so that they don't buckle, um, this will lead to um, um, problems due to the weak secondary interactions between the molecules. So as a consequence, the fibers themselves will fail at um, fairly low stress. So, so that's a limitation with organic fibers. They have low uh, uh, compression strength. I wanted to uh, also talk a little bit about flexibility. So this is a term that is often uh, misused. I should not um, uh, criticize material chemists uh, too strongly, but uh, it is a fact that if you read the materials literature for for engineering materials, and the, uh, the author uh, is a material chemist, they very often want to discuss flexibility. For instance, you make a film and you say the film is very nice because it's very flexible. I think most of the times what they're referring to then is that I can, I can bend the film and it doesn't fracture. It's, it's not a brittle film. But for fibers, this is obviously also true. Um, I have briefly mentioned high modulus fibers. You saw there are carbon fibers with a modulus of uh, 400 gigapascal, at least. There are actually fibers now available with a modulus of 600 gigapascal. Those fibers tend to be really, really brittle in terms of handling. If you have a bundle of high modulus carbon fibers, they tend to fracture very easily. So the question is, why is that? Why, why are they not as flexible as, for instance, glass fibers? So let's uh, look into the analysis of fiber flexibility. Um, so we call it fiber flexibility. So um, actually what we're after then is um, the moment, so force times length, the moment to bend a fiber to a given radius of curvature and we call this rho. Now this, uh, the expression for this uh, is the following, so the bending moment required is uh, pi times the modulus, which we already defined, times the, so d is fiber diameter, 
and this um, should be divided by 64 times uh, the radius of curvature. Okay, um, if we then have, as we must assume, elastic deformation, then we would be interested in um, finding out the stress because we the problem with brittle fibers is that we're breaking them when we bend them too much. So radius of curvature is the radius of curvature that you can bend the fiber to before it, it breaks. Um, so we need to express the stress and if it's elastic deformation we just um, use this expression, so it's um, modulus of the fiber times its diameter divided by two times the radius of uh, curvature. And uh, yeah, so this is equation one, this is equation two. And sigma, of course, is stress. So that's just the stress for a given deformation. Now, I need to, uh, I don't have more space, so I need to uh, erase from the top here. So, um, if we then have a fiber with a given strength, so For a given fiber strength, the minimum radius of curvature, so we call that uh, rho mine. So what is, how much can we bend this fiber before it breaks? That's the question. That uh, is given by the minimum radius of curvature. So that is simply given by this expression. So we just uh, uh, move this one up. So we get um, modulus times diameter of the fiber divided by uh, two times the fiber strength. That's how we calculate this. And uh, so then it's interesting to compare our different, the different fibers that we have discussed and the data we have. So um, we do that for, for um, we do that for what is called carbon fiber type 1, carbon fiber type 2, and we do it for glass fibers. I will explain in a moment why we cannot do it for, for aramid fibers. Then we have um, diameter of the fiber, we have the modulus, we have the fiber strength, And we should then, if we use this expression, we should then be able to calculate um, the minimum radius of curvature in millimeters. So 8, 8, 11. Uh, this is uh, 390 for a high modulus fiber, 250 for a regular type of fiber. And this is 75 for glass fibers. Then this is quoted as 2.2 gigapascal, 2.7. And then we take an example of a very strong glass fiber which has not been damaged, 3.5. Then we get uh, 0.71 for the high modulus fiber. 
we got, get roughly half that value for the high strain fiber. And the interesting thing is that the, the lowest value for minimum radius of curvature. So in other words, we can bend the glass fiber to the smallest radius before it breaks. So that's roughly, um, uh, yeah, between almost one fourth of, of uh, what for the carbon fibers. And the reason, of course, is that the um, modulus here is um, much lower. It's e times the diameter. And we can also see that the diameter is going to make a big difference. And if we can increase the strength, we also improve things. So that's, uh, that's really it. And I'd just like to finish off by summarizing this uh, lecture on fibers and clarify what I think is important in a material science perspective. Um, in order to understand fibers. So we have some kind of uh, processing route to make the fibers. This results in a fine structure or at molecular level and um, at nanoscale. And we are, of course, interested in the properties of these fibers and we are, well, we have primarily been concerned with modulus and strength. And uh, if we understand this, we have a very good basis for uh, comparing fibers and to understand them at a deeper level because we can then uh, see how the processing influences the structure and how the structure influences the properties. And we can actually compare uh, different types of fibers and we can explain property differences based on structure. And I think perhaps one of the interesting things is that within a given class of fibers, in particular for polymer fibers and for carbon fibers, we can see very strong correlation between structural details and the properties that we obtain. Thank you very much.